going to be speaking from Philippians chapter 3. Title my sermon tonight, The Upward Call. You know, we were singing some songs tonight. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. We have to think about what makes Jesus so worthy. And uh, Jesus is supposed to have worth. It is supposed to be a natural response. The worthiness of Jesus is supposed to be something that is there throughout our lives. Not brought to a crescendo when the music is playing. Not brought to a crescendo, not bro, you know, crescendo means not brought to a higher volume when the emotions are going. That's the challenge, isn't it? It's a challenge for a lot of us, especially when we're young, as we're growing older, it doesn't change. But the challenge is when we feel when the music is playing and we're warmed up and we're in a spirit of praise and there are other people around us, we can feel a better sense of the worthiness of the Lord. The challenge is to really embrace him and his worthiness all the time. How do we see that? How do we move from the worthiness of the Lord being a little bit more natural when we're singing songs to it being a daily routine? One of the things that has been, has been really helpful in that is to see when Jesus was slain and to see the cross that Jesus died on. And most of us, most of our songs tend to direct us and direct the songs towards the cross on which Jesus died at the end of his life. And we think about the pain and the agony and there was an incredible, definitely the, the cross that Jesus died on at the end of his life was the culmination of all of his life. But I personally believe that if I am to find the worthiness of Jesus every day, I have to see the worthiness of Jesus in the fact that he was slain every day. Because that's the same path I must to take on every day too. I may not get to die on a cross, I may not get to be eaten by lions, I may not get to go out of this life in the same way Jesus did. But every day I have the same cross that Jesus had on which he was slain. And if I will see him who faced the same temptation that I was slain to his self-will but living by the power of the Holy Spirit, meanwhile I'm falling into the sin, I will see the worthiness of Jesus in that moment. There is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. There's no condemnation in Jesus Christ. There's just adoration and admiration and worship every time you sin. Every time you sin, the first thing you must do is look up and see Jesus who didn't do what you did. Who, figured, who found the way of escape, it says. He was tempted in all points. He could have shouted at his mother. He could have shouted at his father. He could have shouted at his brothers. He could have gotten angry. He could have blown up with his mouth. But he never did. Never. Not once. And if every time I were to realize he was not caught up with the world than I was. And if rather than beating myself up. If I were to bow at the cross on which he was slain every day and worship him, then that spirit of worthiness will become a daily, Lord Jesus, you truly are worthy. Because I was tempted five times today or 25 times today, and I was successful 60% of the time. And you were successful 100%. Day after day after day for 365 days times 30 years times 33 years. 
There's a moment for you to say, worthy is the lamb every single day, family. And it's in the moment of temptation, not when everything is going okay. You have to find the cross on which Jesus died for 33 years. If you want to know the love that Jesus had for you, before you find the cross on which he blood, bled, find the cross on which he died when he was 15 years old, and 16, and 17. You know how difficult it is. It is you are 16. You are 17. You know how difficult the crosses are. Now think about Jesus who never sinned and always was slain to his selfish desires. You following me? Every day. There's no condemnation, family. There's plenty of opportunities to worship and to say, worthy, you, you are Lord Jesus, every day. Every day you're worthy. Then I don't need the choir to be just right or I don't need the bass in my car to be playing properly for me to worship him. I could do it as whenever I face temptation. When you survey the wondrous cross, have you surveyed the wondrous cross on which Jesus died when he was 16? You have plenty of opportunities because you're going to be 16 for a whole year. Survey it. Survey how he dealt with peer pressure. Survey how he dealt with imperfect parents because he had it too. Survey how he dealt with siblings who made fun of him and who were also imperfect and were always messing him up and provoking him. Survey that cross on which Jesus died every day. Then we'll have many, t many chances to worship. It's in this context that I want you to also read this verse in Psalm, uh, Philippians chapter 3, 17 through 21. It says there, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I often told you, now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now think about enemies of the cross of Christ in context of what I just said. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble and state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. And we have two choices. You see in verse 17, Paul says you can follow my example and those who are, he, who are with Paul. Or you can follow the many. And it's been true in Paul's day and it is true in our day too. You have Paul and his example, follow my example, or follow the many enemies of the cross of Christ. So I want to talk about the enemies of the cross of Christ and Paul and lay out very clearly, hopefully, as I see it, as clearly as I see it, some of the characteristics of those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, we may have passed over this passage thinking these are people who don't believe in the crucifixion of Jesus or people who don't believe that he died on the cross physically. I want us to think about it a little bit more than that. I want us to think about enemies of the cross of Christ as being enemies of that cross on which Jesus died daily. People who refuse to think that you must die to your selfish wills every day. They too are enemies of the cross of Christ. They too rejected. And I believe that, I don't believe that Paul was warning the Philippians against people who were clearly heretics who were saying that Jesus didn't even die on the cross. Don't believe, given everything that I read about the Philippian church and how they were serious in many ways in following the Lord, that they would have to be warned against such outward heretics. But there was a much closer deception of people who were enemies of the daily cross of Christ. The cross on which Jesus died daily. And there can be many Christians. So then let me talk now about some of the characteristics of the enemies of the cross of Christ. Let me underline that they are many. You've got Paul and a few. Those who are following Paul. And then you've got many. So don't expect there to be a whole lot of people who want to follow the example of Paul. 
you will find in Christianity that there are many people who are secretly enemies of the cross of Christ. Not the cross on which Jesus died in physically, but the cross on which Jesus died every day on the inside. So the next slide I talk about some of those things. First of all, many enemies of the cross of Christ. First of all in verse 19, whose end is destruction but whose God is their appetite. Whose God is their appetite. Now an appetite, is that able to come up? What, so what is it, our appetite? I thought of our appetite as what satisfies us. And it's the, another word for appetite that's in that, uh, in the Bible is, for this word is belly. What's, what's in your gut? What's in your instinct? What feels right? I just feel like saying this right now to somebody. I just have to get it off my chest. I have to talk about somebody else. I just have to tell my spouse what I think about them. I just have to tell my younger brother or my younger sister exactly how unchristlike she is. Going by one's gut, going by one's whatever one feels like doing, whatever feels right becomes our God. And this is something that has plagued us from the beginning of when we sinned. That there's this, just tell me what you feel. This, I'm just thinking out loud. I'm just processing out loud. And we just talk bad about other people. And we'll just pour out all of that filth we have in our mind. Because it just feels like I need to get it off my chest. And there's a lot of us, and we, I think we heard earlier today too, how the tongue is such a dangerous member because it can set the whole body aflame, is what it said in James. And our tongues and our minds and our eyes, small body parts, can just set us ablaze because we go with whatever feels right. We go with our gut instinct. And the world tells you, just go with your gut. Just go with whatever you feel with you, what you're doing. It's not the way of God. God doesn't say go with your gut. Be led by the Spirit. It's not your gut. It's not your appetite. It's not whatever you feel like doing. It's being led by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Not living by your gut. And the enemy of the cross of Christ may feel right, and then it gets even worse. We start to glory in our shame. What does it mean to glory in our shame? Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. We were not created as people who were ashamed. And let me tell you how unashamed we were in Genesis chapter, the end of Genesis chapter 2. This is how God created us and how unashamed we were. God looked at us and said, you are very good. And God also created us to which way we did not have any shame. Genesis chapter 2 verse 25. He says, and the man and his wife were both naked. This is before they sinned. And they were not ashamed. There was no, no shame in them at all. Even though they were completely naked. Then you know what happened in Genesis chapter 3. Where the serpent deceived Eve and Adam. And then they both ate of the fruit. And they both ate verse 6. And then verse 7, you see what happens. The moment they ate of the fruit, their eyes were opened. They knew that they were naked and they immediately started to feel ashamed and they started to cover themselves. The moment sin comes in, you start to get ashamed. And you go with your gut instinct. So going back to Philippians chapter 3, you go with whatever feels right. You don't want to listen to God's word. You don't want to walk by the Spirit. You want to say, hey, look, I want to be my own man. I want to be my own person. I want to be independent. And I want to go with my gut. I've got a mind. I'm going to use it. I've got a tongue. I'm going to use it. And all those things. My hand is going to go on Facebook wherever it needs to go. I can click wherever I want. I've got freedom in Christ. And I use all these reasons to maybe just go wherever I want to go. Going with whatever feels right. So much so that I start to glory in my shame. That my sinfulness and my sinful activities almost starts to become my glory 
We start to be proud of the fact that we go by our gut instinct. And you see that in the world. People are boasting about how much, hey, I get to do whatever I want. When you're 18, you can just leave your parents' house and just go and do whatever you want. Nothing wrong with leaving your parents when you're 18. I did that. But the question is, what kind of spirit are you going with? To just go and be free and do whatever you want and to be set free from all the shackles? And you start to glory in the fact, and you know what was caused the shame back in Genesis? That they said, I don't want to be under God. I want to know for myself what is right and wrong. I want to decide what's right. I want to decide whether watching those movies is right or wrong. I get to decide whether going and doing this and doing that. You can't tell me where to go and what to do. And that's what Eve also felt. I would like to decide what's the definition of right and what's the definition of wrong. I want to be wise in my own eyes. I want to have my own wisdom. I don't want to come under God. I don't want to be led by the Spirit. And now we're getting to the point where we start to glory in our shame. We glory in shameful activities. Shameful things happening in the world. And we're starting to glory in it, calling it equality. Calling it, we're, we're glorying in all kinds of things that started out as shameful. And it's out there in the world, but can be true in the church too. Enemies of the cross of Christ who say you're going to die to yourself will. God is their appetite, going with their gut, going doing whatever they want, glorying and going even further to saying, I'm actually proud of it. I'm going to stand and tell you I can do whatever I want. I'm going to think like myself. I'm going to read all these philosophers and all these novelists and all these new age people. And I'm going to say that that's right. And I start to glory in it, thinking that that's just great, thinking for myself. Not willing to come under the authority of God's word. Not coming willing to come under the authority of the creator. And who set their minds on earthly things. Enemies of the cross of Christ at the end of the day can be summarized in one thing. They set their minds on earthly things. Are there a lot of Christians who set their minds on earthly things? You tell me. You just look at your own life and ask yourself, Lord Jesus, am I one who sets my mind on earthly things? If you set your mind on earthly things, the earthly way of life, the world system is going to tell you, go with your gut. Rationalize whatever you're thinking in your own mind and do accordingly. And you'll start to go with your gut and it'll feel good. And you'll even start to glory in your shame. Remember, shame came into this world. When we decided we didn't want to do it God's way. And God had told us to have all of the Garden of Eden. And he just said, don't touch this one fruit. And the one fruit which is saying, I want to do it my own way. I want to have my own definition of right and wrong. And that's when shame came into our lives. And now we live in a society where we glory in that. And we live in a culture, which is even true in Christianity, where we glory in our own self-intellectual independence. Enemies of the cross of Christ. Still thanking God for what he did on the cross on Sunday mornings. Still weeping when they watch Passion of the Christ. Still coming on Good Friday services if the churches have Good Friday services. But enemies of the daily cross of Christ on which Jesus died when he was 16. And when he was 17. And when he was 18. 100% of the time. 365 days of the year. He was dying. And through our lifestyle, through the choices we make, we decide whether we're set on earthly things or we are set towards glorying in the cross of Christ. Were you moved when we sang about the cross of Christ? Were you moved when you sang just now about worthy is the Lamb? Will you be moved when you survey the cross on which Jesus died at your next temptation? If you set your mind on earthly things and you want to do it your way, you won't, it won't move you. But if when you fall into that temptation, you will survey the cross on which Jesus died, it will move you because you'll wonder, how, how did he do it? How did he do it 100% of the time? How year after year after his kids, after his brothers kept and sisters kept needling him and getting under his skin, he never once committed sin and there was no sin found in his mouth there was no deceit found in it how is it 
that he did it. And if you survey that cross, there will be an altogether different kind of worship that comes out of our lives. There's an altogether different kind of worthiness that comes out of our lives when we survey that cross. And we have to see ourselves in our daily lives as being possible enemies of the cross of that Christ. But Paul's our example. So I want to talk a lot more about how rather than just doing, not doing the negative, we concentrate on doing the positive. So let's look at Paul's example. And I wanted to start, I mean, the whole passage from 7 through 21 is an incredible passage. I want to start with verse 13. I do not regard myself, 13 and 14, I do not regard myself as having laid a hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let me give you a word of encouragement right there in the beginning. I do not regard myself as having laid a hold of it yet. He's just like us. He's not any different. He too is trying to lay hold of it. And we'll talk about what he's trying to lay a hold of. But this is in a nutshell what he does. And this is where we can begin. Every single one of us can begin here. Forget. First start by forget. Forget what lies behind. Forget all the failures you've made up till now. Forget all the successes you've made up to now. Forget all of the missteps. Forget all the horrors. Forget all the bad things people have said about you. Forget all the bad things you have said to other people. Of course you must ask for forgiveness. But don't let the guilt and the weight of that weigh you down. Because you're going to need to reach forward. You're going to need to strain forward. How many of you Christians are people who are straining forward? As opposed to thinking you're just standing on an escalator going towards heaven. Is there a straining forward that characterizes your daily life? I need to move forward. I need to actively get up and push past that second mile and that third mile in my pursuit towards Christ. And I need to press on toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Forgetting, reaching forward, pressing on. Every single one of you young people, every single one of us here in this room can do those three things. Because it's all a starting point of saying, you're here in the present. And he's, Paul is saying, I'm going to forget. Because I too haven't laid a hold of it. And you can follow my example. Or you can follow the example of the many who are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Follow my example. Forget what lies behind. Now start reaching forward. Start doing something to reach forward to what lies ahead what God has planned for you. We heard earlier about Jeremiah 29. I have plans for you. Reach forward if you still feel you are exiled in Babylon in that, and slave to the world system. Forget what leaves behind. Forget that Babylonian system and now reach forward to the promise of the future God has for you. And press on toward the goal. And here is the goal that Paul had. And there was a prize in this goal. The prize in the goal of Paul was the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The prize for Paul was the upward call, call of God in Christ Jesus. And I wanted to talk about that upward call because we're talking about the kingdom. We're talking about the kingdom and the glorious majesty of the kingdom. And I wanted to share with you what this upward call of God meant for me. What is that upward call of God that is so attractive, family of God? What is that upward call of God that is going to give you the power to say no to your selfish lusts and passions that are so attractive, that are wonderfully attractive? To shout at somebody is wonderfully attractive. To lust after women is wonderfully attractive. To want the things of this earth is wonderfully attractive. And those of us who struggle with anxiety and worry also find that that's a weirdly strange, pleasurable addiction. We enjoy it even though we know we're hurting ourselves. That is the way it is with the world. 
What is the upward call of God in Christ Jesus? I want to share with you what was the upward call for me. I want to tell you three, show you three verses. One is in Genesis chapter 3 verse 9. Because, and I'm highlighting here after people sinned, the first two of them, and all of us, in all of these three areas I want to talk about, it's after you've sinned. Because, look, it's, it's easy to follow Jesus when everybody around us is in camp and having a good time and singing songs, and we're surrounded with people who are going to protect us from blowing up. And even if we go outside and are on Facebook and watching videos, we're not going to go real crazy on it because we never know when somebody will come and look at it. So it's a little bit easier to fight temptation over here but you go back and it's a little bit more difficult so for me I want to give you words of encouragement to help you when you find that you fall down I told you already survey the cross on which Jesus died on he faced the same temptation and he overcame and you didn't but when you fall into sin this is a word that has really helped me really helped me what is the first thing that God told Adam and Eve after they sinned Where are you? What is the first thing we parents say to our children? What is the first thing your parents tell the children after they've done something wrong? Why'd you do it? We of the flesh on Adam love to tell our children, why'd you do it? Why? Why'd you disobey daddy? Why'd you disobey mommy? Why? You know, Jesus did ask of that. God did ask that. Did you eat of them? But that was the second question. He didn't want to confront the sin. But I took a huge lesson out of the first question God asked when Adam and Eve sinned. What was the first question? Where are you? How unlike us God is. God was so interested in relationship. And it's the upward call of God. God is up in heaven and you sin and you fall into temptation and you fall in sin and you're in the muck and the dirt of sin and God comes to you and says where are you come on up come up to me I want to talk to you see it says in verse 8 that God was walking in the cool of the garden he could have said from the edge of the garden hey Adam and Eve come on out where are you he was walking searching for them he said I want to draw you to me. Where are you? What's the first thing God asks you when you sin? Have you heard him also say, Hey, where are you? Come on in. Come sit on my lap. Let's talk. Why'd you do that? That's the second question. But first, let's make sure your position is correct. I'm not coming at you with a whip. And I'll tell you why he's not coming in a whip. It's in the rest of that sentence. The upward call of God in Christ Jesus. But because of that, he's not coming at you with a whip. He wants you to first set your position right. Don't ever interact with God in any place except the lack of God. Don't ever interact with God in any other position except the lack of God. That's why Jesus died for your sins. So that he could draw you to himself, to the Father's lap. Remember that family of God. When you sin, the first thing God's going to ask you is, Hey, where are you? He's not mad at you. Come back onto his lap and let's have a conversation with him. Seated on the lap of God. The lap of God. What is the lap of God? The lap of love. The lap of love that died for you. The lap of love that gave up everything for you. Sit on that lap and process why you said what you said, why you did what you did, why you watched what you watched. Process all of that on the lap of God. Luke chapter 15 is the other story that really helped me. I've spoken on this before, but Luke chapter 15, when was it that the prodigal son who had done everything crazy, had done everything wrong in his life, when did things start to change? In verse 17 it says, when he came to his senses, and this is what happens when you come to your senses. This is a sign that you've come to your senses spiritually. That you say, my father's house has it better. Verse 18, I will get up and go home to my father. 
That's when you have your spiritual senses. It's the upward call of God in Christ Jesus is get up and come home. Get up and leave that pig farm and come and sit on my lap. Because I want to throw a party for you. Because you're home again. You were in the pig farm, but now you're home again. So before we get to talking about why you did what you did and end up in the pig farm, let's have a party because you're home. And let's throw a feast for you because you're home. I'm talking about this, doing this every time you sin. This is the absolute truth of what changed my life. I kept believing in this God who kept asking me, I'm most interested of where you are. Where are you? Are we still talking from a distance? You're still sitting at the end of the door and talking to me? You're still sitting on the outer courts of God's throne and saying, I'm not worthy? Come on in. Not because of your own worthiness, but because of the blood of the Lamb. Come on in. Don't, don't insult me by sitting all the way on the end. Come and sit on my lap. Says who? Creator of the universe, God Almighty. And I... There's a word I use called appropriated it. I don't know how to explain it a little bit more simply. I made it my own. I, made, I took that truth about where are you, Sandeep? That's the question I want to ask you. And come, come to your senses and come back to the Father. And I made it my own. And I said, Lord, I'm going to believe in this God because this is a God worth adoring. And I kept doing that. Day in and day out. After I sinned and after I sinned and after I sinned. And the lap of love, the lap of God's l loving kindness started to change me. It was more pleasurable to sit in the lap of love than to do the things that I used to do. Now it's been several years. It's no different. The sins are slightly different. But God continues to shine the light on these different sins in my life. But the way out is the same. He's showing me areas and different areas in my life that look as filthy or worse, more filthy than the previous sins I committed. Sins of the heart, sins of the mind, sins of the attitude. And God says, don't change the process. Don't think you now have to do something different. Keep coming back to the lap of love. And we'll talk about it and we'll work it out. You'll inherit the divine, you'll, you'll partake of the divine nature because of my promises. Not by obeying all the commands, but because of his divine and magnificent promises, we will start to partake of the divine nature. We'll start to taste of it. Because that's where you're sitting all the time. You'll be hanging out with them most of the time. Because your mind is not set on earthly things. Those of us who, have enemy, who are enemies of the cross of Christ, we set our minds on the earthly things. And God is saying, come on up. Come sit in my lap. Make your default position my lap. One more verse that talks to this, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. He raised you up with him and seated you with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Right there with him. That's where you've got to be seated, not set on earthly things. That's where you've got to be seated all the time. And as we've heard that analogy from my dad, it's like a rubber band that's stretched. You're stretched to do the things of this earth, like take care of your family and go to your job and do the different things that you need to do. But you're really, your desire is to be in the heavenly places. Your default position is the lap of love. That's where you're sitting. Paul said, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal where the prize is this. Here's my prize. Every day, here's the prize. The upward call of God. The upward call of God. Where God's saying, come on home. What a relieving message, family of God. We're all pilgrims. We're all strangers. We're all aliens in this world. And God's message is, come on home. I've come to introduce you to my father, is what Jesus came to say. I've come to introduce you to my father. I've come to settle it. I come to introduce you to the kingdom where there's no more fear. You don't have to live with, your, with the noose of fear around you anymore. You can be at rest. I give you a peace that the world can't give you. It's on the Father's lap. Secure. Underneath are the everlasting arms. I've loved you with an everlasting love. What a wonderful place to be. 
it'll start to show in your face. It'll start to show in your speech. It'll start to show in your eyes. It'll start to show in your actions. There goes a man who's loved. You don't know if he's all that he does, but he surely acts like he's loved. That woman doesn't preach a message. That woman just is in the background, but boy, does she act like she's loved. I reach forward, I press on to where the goal of the, where the prize is. God's just saying, come on home. Come on home. Come home again. You've got five minutes on your drive from here to the store. Come on home. Sit with me on my lap and let's talk. Let's build this relationship. And you've got 15 minutes or something when you're driving home where it's quiet. It's 10 minutes before you're about to go to sleep. Come on higher. Talk to me. It's not a holy God trying to beat you up. It's a, it's a settling place, family. It's a place where you can rest. This is not theory I'm speaking. This is something that I do daily. I think there are a lot of things that pressure me and a lot of thoughts that I battle in terms of I wish you had done this differently. I wish you had done this better. You're this old and you still haven't figured out all these things. And I struggle with a lot of these things, but the struggle is not so... The struggle is just become so much easier for me to deal with because I just take it to the place that I've learned is the wonderful place to take it, which is the, which is the lap of love. It's been a wonderful place to set it there and say, Lord, you're happy with me, right? He says, I created you. I formed you in your innermost being. How precious are your thoughts to me? How vast is the sum of them? We heard that earlier today. If I would count them, they would outnumber the sun. That's the star, sorry, the sand. If, I would, if you would account how much God is thinking about you, it would outnumber the sand. And it says, the, last, the second part of that verse in Psalm 139, 18, it says, when I wake, I'm still with you. I went to sleep in your arms. And when I woke, you're still there. You know, when I get my children to go to sleep, I'm holding them. And then the moment they go to sleep, I'm like, thank you. And I put them in the crib. <laughs> go to sleep. My job's over. God's different. God holds us the whole time. There's nothing better he'd rather do than to hold us. Because so when I awake, he's still with me. Wow, what a surprise. Yeah, I never left you. You never left me. What a wonderful life to live. Where the creator of the universe, God Almighty, has such precious thoughts about us. And we believe it. We embrace it. We appropriate it. We make it ours. If he formed you in your innermost being, it'll, we have to really ask the Lord to give us the eyes to see that. And the upward call of God is in Christ Jesus. I don't want to don't want to diminish. I speak strongly of how bold you must go to enter God's presence. How bold you must be to enter God's presence. But don't think it was because of just because God winks at sin and God is okay with sin it's because of the price that was paid not on Calvary for 33 years and then on Calvary and for me I am much more in awe I really am not saying that to diminish what happened to God to, to, to Jesus on Calvary but I'm so much in awe of what God did when he was a 16 year old Day after day after day. You know it. You're 16. And I'm in awe of how he lived with all of his lusts and his passion when he was 21. And he did it. And he did it faithfully for 33 years. And he died on the cross separated from God. And he says, now you guys can all run into God's lap whenever you want. Don't ever forget his sacrifice. That is why we see that for Paul, Jesus was everything. And the previous verses, 7 through 14, so many times, if you want to scan in your Bible, as I've kind of written it out there, in verse chapter 3, verse 7, he says, I've counted all things as lost for the sake of Christ. And then in verse 8, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, not theology, not going to heaven, not being filled with the Holy Spirit, not planting lots of churches. All of those things are great. 
But all of these things I count of loss so that I know him. Verse 8, so that I may gain Christ. Verse 9, so that I may be found in him. Verse, nine, verse 10, that I may know him. Verse 10, again, that I may know the power of his resurrection. Verse 10, that I may know the fellowship of his sufferings. Verse 12, I may lay hold of that which also I was laid off of by Christ Jesus. His whole identity, everything he was saying, I'll throw everything else out. I just want to know Jesus. I want to be found in him. I want to know the surpassing value of Jesus Christ, my Lord. I want to give up everything for the sake of Christ. Jesus had become special. And it wasn't just Jesus on the cross on Calvary. It was Jesus on the cross every single day of his life. I think most of you who you're here are younger than Jesus when he died on the cross. At least folks who are in the, young, in the group. He was your age. I don't know how to make it more simple than that. He was your age. And the Bible says in Hebrews 4.15, he was tempted in all points just like you are. You think that addiction is too hard for you to give up? You think that girl is too pretty to not constantly be messaging and bothering? You think that sin is too difficult? Get your eyes off of yourself and just consider Jesus. What the Bible says about him, that he never sinned. He never did it once. We marvel at LeBron James and all these football players, Messi, Ronaldo, whatever the sport is, or whatever the cooking show is maybe, or whatever it is that people are fancy about, and how they have all these moves, and we're watching YouTube videos, and we're like, my goodness, you see how he put the ball over his head, and then through his legs, and under his legs, and in and out, and we marvel at that. For five minutes, marvel at Jesus, who struggled in this one thing that you find so difficult. He found the way of escape. And he had nothing that you don't have. He had a flesh like yours that tugged him to do his own will. And he had the Holy Spirit, which God says, I'll give freely. Like a father gives to hungry children, I'll give you the Holy Spirit. For those who ask him in simple faith. And with those, that power of the Holy Spirit, he overcame. And if we would get our mind off earthly things, and stop being enemies of the cross of Christ, that daily cross. And saying, Lord Jesus, I don't want to be an enemy of that cross anymore. I really want to set my mind on you. I want to think, just when I fall, when I blurt out something in anger. When I think, of, I read that, that article I really shouldn't have read. I want to think about how you did it. How you had such consistency and faithfulness every day. And I just want to marvel at you. I guarantee you in the name of Jesus that the devil will, you will frustrate the devil's plan that he has for you every time he causes you or gets you to fall in sin. He wants to condemn you. He wants to accuse you. But when you don't bother about the accusations and you start to adore Jesus who did it differently than you, you'll find victory through the praise that you give through Jesus. That's the victory through praise. It's not the victory through praise that we sing on Sunday mornings that give you the victory. Praise Jesus when you're down in the pig farm. In the, just look at him. You don't have to do anything yourself. Just look at him and marvel at how he differs. And say, Jesus, I'm a mess, but you're amazing. God will give you the victory. There's a victory that comes through the praise of Jesus even when you're down in sin. You're young people. I don't promise you a, a, a pathway of life where you'll never sin. I haven't found that myself. But I can give you a pathway to tell you what to do when you do sin. When you do sin, you can have an advocate. When you're down in that pig farm, look up at him. Stop looking at yourself. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. This is what we do instead of setting our minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to stop setting our minds on earthly things and we need to become kingdom citizens. You need to trade in your old passport. What passport? The passport that says, I pledge allegiance to this world system. It's a question about allegiance. You know, that's what they ask you to do when you become a citizen of this country. They make you all raise your hand and they tell you you're going to pledge allegiance to America as opposed to India. I had my Indian passport. It's not just a document I get. 
There's much more to it. Now I'm promising to be part of the American society where I will defend America. Even if India comes to war against it. That's what it means to be a citizen of America. And I had to do that when I gave up my Indian passport and said I want to be an American citizen. Now if our citizenship is in heaven, that means it's pretty much saying our government, the kingdom of he is of heaven. Our, we need to find that our, the kingdom that we belong to, the citizenship that we have is in heaven. And we need to make an allegiance to it. Those of us who are men understand what it means to have an allegiance to a sports team, for example. I love the Dallas Cowboys. I actually don't. I don't care for them at all. <laughs> Whatever it is, right? The Eagles, or the 49ers, in my, where I'm in California, or the Denver Broncos. What does it mean to be faithful fan of the Denver Broncos. Will you consider wearing a Kansas City shirt? <laughs> Will you consider wearing a 49ers jersey and be a true fan? Will you think, oh, I, I secretly wish, I hope the 49ers win against the Broncos today. Is that a true fan? What does it mean to be a citizen of heaven? It's rooting for heaven to win. In you. <laughs> In you, that's where heaven wants to win. Are you rooting for heaven to win in you every day? It's a mindset family. And maybe you grew up in California and you're rooting for the 49ers. Now you come to Denver and you're going to have to make a choice. And if you finally decide because all your friends are Broncos fans, I'm going to now become a Broncos fan. There's some, some things that are going to come with it. You're going to have to stop rooting for the 49ers. It's painful, isn't it? <laughs> Got to start rooting for the Broncos now. When you say your citizenship is in heaven, you have to stop rooting for the things of this world. Oh, how we long for the things of this world, the nice bright new car, or the new gadget, or the pretty girl, or the fancy guy who's the pop pop guy, whatever it is. That's how the world thinks. We want honor, we want elite, we want to be looked at as cool and relevant and significant. And I'm the one that all the elders appreciate. And I'm the one with the responsibility or I'm the one with gets up to speak. I'm the one with a special message from God. I'm the one with a wonderful talent to play something or the other. Some way or the other, I'm the one who's really good in this or that. I'm somehow trying to be significant. And that's the world system. And we have to pledge allegiance to God's system. But he says, the greatest is the servant who seeks to become the least among you, who seeks to be taken up with Jesus and is not interested and less and less interested with needing to be popular and thought of as so cool and important or holy or whatever it is, who's so caught up with Jesus, who says, I'll consider all as loss so that I can find Christ. It's a question of allegiance, family. It's a question of, are you really willing to burn that jersey which says world system? You know, you need to stop rooting for the world system in your life. And that's what it is. These selfish desires are just basically you saying, I'm still part of team world. And you have to ask yourself, Lord, I, if you want to get out of being this enemy of the cross system, Lord, I want to really decide. Today I'm going to burn that world system jersey. I'm going to put on your jersey which says my citizenship is in heaven and I pledge allegiance today to your kingdom and I'm going to let it have your way being done because that's the rule in the kingdom of God. You don't get to do whatever you want, whatever your gut says you can do. You're not going to glory and saying I can do whatever I want. It's a free choice family. This is not compulsion. You can do it your way if you want. The, but the message of Jesus, the message of the Bible is saying you can trade in that jersey and you can get the jersey of heaven. But you don't get to do it your way anymore. You get to submit to God. And he's written in his word. So you pledge allegiance to God. Pledge allegiance to his way. And your example is Jesus. Who pledged allegiance to God and when he was on this earth. And never did his own will. Never did. When we get to follow in his example. 
and we learn that we can control our eyes a little better and better because we don't set our mind on earthly things. We are setting ourselves on the lap of God and enjoying His love over us that even the whole world thinks we're not cool. God tells me I'm good enough. I'm fine. I can't tell you the number of times I need to hear God tell me that. And let that be a message of hope to those of you who think you're so insecure or you're fighting for popularity. I struggle with it too. But I have found the way out. It's not by preaching better sermons or having some ministry. It is only in one place and that is the lap of love that I go all the time, as often as I can, and it has helped me control my eyes, and it has helped me control my tongue, and things are a lot better for me than it was five years ago and ten years ago. But I made a decision that I'm going to pledge allegiance to the kingdom of God, and I'm going to keep going to the lap of God. If it meant 500 times a day, that's what I was going to do. If I sinned 500 times a day, I was going to get up and go home. And it's made a difference. And then this last point there, the last second part of that verse, eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I hear people talk about, Lord Jesus, please come soon. And most people who pray that are praying that for one of two reasons, at least I found. Either it is because they're scared of what's coming into this world and it's all kinds of wars and all kinds of society is going crazy and it's going away from God and they're like, Lord Jesus, please come soon. That's one reason. Another reason is because maybe their bodies are getting old and they're starting to feel the creak in the bones and they're starting to feel the pain of the back pain and the arthritis and the cancer and all that. Like, Lord Jesus, please come soon. And so for two of the reasons, I tend to find people starting to think about, Lord Jesus, please come soon. But I don't think that that's what this is talking about. I don't have any creaks in my bones as yet. I also feel some pains, but that's not the reason why I'm eagerly waiting Jesus. I'm not eagerly waiting Jesus because society has gone crazy. I really am not. I was awaiting Jesus way before I thought society was going crazy. I was awaiting Jesus because this is the person I have never seen. But I sing about so often. I think about him so often. I talk to him so often, but I've never seen him. He's become my best friend. He's the person who loved me and gave everything for me, and I've never met him. I say... When am I going to see you? I, I say this with all respect. If my father and my mother were to die, and I love them dearly, if my father and mother were to die tomorrow, I'm not afraid of saying if my father and mother died tomorrow, by the way, because I'm not superstitious. I have a loving father. <laughs> He's not going to be bothered by what I say. God's numbered my parents' days and nobody can change that. Not me saying anything for sure. So if my parents were to die tomorrow and the Lord was to come two years from now and I'm going up to heaven raptured because I was still alive and I see my dad and my mom in glory I hope by then I would have such a fondness for Jesus that I would push my dad and my mom aside and say let me see what makes really heaven precious. I love my loved ones. I'd be looking forward to seeing all my loved ones who die. But that's not what makes heaven heaven. Not seeing my dad and my mom again. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful hope that we have. I don't, as I said, I, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way. I'm just meaning it to compare to how much greater our love for Jesus must be. That's the eagerness with which we must wait for Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about it because society is going bad. I'm not talking about it because we're, uh, uh, our age is catching up with this. I'm talking about a different kind of eagerness. That we're waiting for him because he really is our best friend. He's spoken to us. He has gotten us out of every jam we've been in. He's given us words of life. Man shall live by words that proceed. And time after time I went in his name and I sought him and he delivered me. And he kept getting me out of the snares of the devil who was trying to destroy me for all eternity. Lord Jesus, where, where are you? I want to see you. Can, I can only imagine what it must be like when I see him. 
You know that song, will I fall down at his feet? Will I be able to sing hallelujah? Can you have, you, have you thought about that? Have you thought of yourself being raptured and on your way up to heaven? And seeing the feast and all the food ready for the wedding of the lamb, but you're like, I'm not interested in what they're having for the wedding lamb food. Where's the bridegroom? Where's he? He has been the object of my fancy for years, for decades. I hope that'll be true of your life. That you've been longing for him, even if you don't have the great church experiences that, you had, don't, that you've heard about in RLCF and that I'm experiencing in NCCF. You don't, may not have that right now, but can you, can you cherish him? Make that a start. Can you and him be alone together? Allured into the desert where it's just you and him, where no man can follow? Even your closest ones are left behind. And in the secret closet you meet with him. And he meets you there in the secret of his presence. And he sustains you. And he becomes your best friend. Yes, he can do that. He's done that for every saint of God. And he's doing that for me. And he's constantly telling me, go back. Go back to the secret closet. Even if you have a good church, go back to the secret closet. And establish a relationship. I'm not talking about hours in prayer. I'm, not ta I'm talking about the secret place where it's just you and him. Even if there are people around you sometimes. It can be you and him, just the two of you together. God can make this a reality. Family, eagerly wait for Jesus. Put on the jersey, will you? Put on the, Jesus, the jersey of heaven. Where the kingdom of heaven is glorious and majestic. Proudly put it on. Wear it. Stop being enemies of the cross of Christ. Where, that's, where your citizenship is in heaven. And eagerly wait. He's coming soon. He's at the door. He's just gone out to get something from the car, so to speak. He's going to be back any minute now. It's very soon. Eagerly wait for him. May God help us.